morning and welcome to worship at Oakdale United Methodist Church. I'm Corey Cook. I'm the pastor of the church, and it is a joy to welcome you to worship with us online. Um, if you would please uh, leave a comment or reach out to me in some way uh, to let me know that you are worshiping with us. And on whatever social media platform that you're using, if you could please share uh, our worship service with your friends and family uh, via social media so that we can uh, reach the world with God's hope. Again, thank you for joining us for worship this morning at Oakdale United Methodist Church. Will you please join in our opening prayer called A Prayer for Hope? Please pray with us as the words appear on your screen. Good and gracious God, you are the giver of life and source of all hope. We are your humble servants and we come before you today in need of hope. There are times when we feel helpless. There are times when we feel weak. We pray for hope. We need hope for a better future. We need hope for a better life. We need hope for love and kindness. Some say that the sky is at its darkest just before the light. We pray that this is true for all seems dark. We need your light, Lord, in every way. We pray to be filled with your light from head to toe to bask in your glory to know that you will make all that is wrong in this world work for your good. Help us to walk in your light and live our lives in faith and hope for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Thank you so much for being a part of our online worship service at Oakdale United Methodist this morning. Please leave a comment and let us know that you're worshiping with us. We are working on our plans for the fall, but during the week this week, we will have no in-person activities. We are planning to resume in-person worship next Sunday, August 16th. And as always, we will be practicing social distancing, and we encourage you to do whatever you think is best for you and your family. We also have a really exciting missions announcement. Many of you know that Oakdale participated in the District Kenya mission trip this past January. It was an amazing experience. We are planning to take our own group on a mission trip to Maua Methodist Hospital in Kenya in the summer of 2021. The dates are June 24th to July 8th. More details will be coming soon, but if you might be interested in going on this trip, please let us know. Also, we really appreciate how so many of you have remained faithful in your giving during this difficult time. Your generosity is so appreciated. There are several ways that you can give. First, you can mail a check to the church at 2675 West Overhill Drive in Stephenville, or you can go to the website, which is www.oakdaleum.org. Click on the donate button and follow the instructions that are there. Or you can give through the Give Plus app, which can be downloaded from the App Store. One other way you can give is by texting the amount you want to give to this phone number, 833-793-0484. You'll be sent a link with instructions. When you give, you're supporting the ongoing work of the church. Now, will you please join us in singing?
turning your Bible or your Bible app to the book of Revelation. I'll be reading from the New International Version. First, let's look together at Revelation 14, 12. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Second, I'm going to read from Revelation 21, 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Our last scripture for today is Revelation 22, verses 1 through 2 and verse 5. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Today we are concluding our sermon series entitled Finding Hope During Challenging Times. As we enter into God's message of hope today, I want to encourage you to have the GPS, your Grow, Pray, and Study Guide handy. You can find the GPS posted on our website at www.oakdaleum.org or attached to the worship email that I sent out earlier this morning. There is a space on the front of the GPS for you to jot down messages of hope that the Holy Spirit speaks directly to you. During these confusing and challenging times, this season of disorientation, we need hope. We desperately need hope. Remember, we've been discussing this cycle of orientation, disorientation, and reorientation from Dr. Dr. Walter Brueggemann, a renowned Old Testament scholar. All of us cycle through these seasons throughout our entire lives. But right now, the whole world seems to be in a state of disorientation due to this COVID crisis and the economic impact it's had around the globe. So just to, just to uh, recall, the seasons of orientation are, times, are, are good times. They're our old normal. They're times when things are going well uh, and there's kind of a positive attitude uh, toward everything in life. The markets are going up. Most people have jobs. Uh, the, the unemployment rate is low. Uh, things are just going well in life in general. Then we enter a season of disorientation that's caused by an unexpected event. Maybe it's the death of a loved one or an unexpected diagnosis or a pandemic sweeps across the globe and sends the entire globe into disorientation like we are today. Those, these seasons of disorientation, though, are times of tremendous growth. Um, and that growth occurs through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And the Holy Spirit works during this time of, of confusion and chaos to bring us hope. And through that hope, we reorient to a new normal. I know we're all sick and tired of hearing a new normal, but it's true. We, we have a, a, this, after this growth, things don't go back to the way they are, but we do get reoriented and we have a new season of good times and of positive outcomes. The longer we stay in this period of disorientation though, the easier it is to lose hope and the harder it becomes to experience reorientation. According to the article, The Impact of COVID-19 Pandemic on Suicide Rates, 
published June 30th of this year in the QJM, an international journal of medicine by Oxford University in England, there is a high probability that suicide rates will increase in many countries of the world. This problem may be especially difficult in the U.S. Suicide rates in the U.S. have been steadily growing over the last two decades. And as suicide rates increase in the U.S., it will add to the trend of rising national rates of suicide around the world. Therefore, we can, we can see that people in general need hope. They desperately need hope. Even here in our community, we need hope. I also want you to recall our working definition of hope. We've been using this the entire sermon series, uh, and that definition is the belief and subsequent action based on the knowledge that tomorrow will, in some meaningful way, be better than today. Personally, this week has been a week of hope for me and my family. It seems like a lifetime ago since our kids were in school. But this week saw the return of two days. The football team across the street from the, from the school, our parking lot full of cars, people getting ready for this new school year. Our daughter Nora began her high school marching band career and her, uh, her, her career with the Stingerettes here at Stephenville High School as they began their practices and getting ready for this new school year. These are signs at the end of summer and the beginning of a new year. Signs of hope. Where have you seen signs of hope this past week? Well, we know that hope is found throughout the Bible. We began this biblical journey several weeks ago by looking at hope found in the Psalms, the songbook or the hymnal of the Bible. Then we turn to God's messengers of hope in the Old Testament, the prophets. We follow that up by looking at hope from Jesus, found in Matthew's Gospel. And then last week, we found hope from the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of Hope, found in his letters or his epistles. And today, we're going to turn to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And we're going to find hope in these closing chapters of the Bible. Several years ago, I was friends with an older gentleman who loved to read mystery novels. He read each novel the same way. He quickly read the first chapter to get a sense of the characters and the stories, and then he turned to the back of the book and read the last chapter. Well, when I learned that about this, this practice of his with these mystery novels, I simply ask him, doesn't that ruin the whole story for you? And his response was, young man, at my age, I can't take for granted that I'll live long enough to finish this book. So I want to know who done it from the very beginning. We had a good chuckle, a good laugh. But then he went on to explain that knowing who done it actually added a deeper appreciation for the story. And so it is with the Bible. As we turn to this concluding book, we find a deeper appreciation for who done it, because we find hope. We read about God's redeeming work of bringing hope to disoriented people, people who are in extreme distress. This book, the book of Revelation, is mysterious and hard to understand, and yet it's filled with hope, a knowledge a, a truth, a belief, and an action that tomorrow will be better than today. Christians throughout history have wrestled with this book and continue to struggle to fully understand its wild and crazy imagery. This book, the book of Revelation, is actually in a genre of literature known as apocalyptic literature, which was a common writing style from about 200 years before Christ until about 200 years following his death. Now, the word apocalypse actually means revealing. This book is a written, a written recording of the vision John, the author, had of Jesus' final triumph over evil. This style of writing uses these vivid images 
to evoke an emotional response in the reader, much like the modern day press uses dramatic videos and pictures. And even though we use apocalypse in media, it is almost non-existent in modern written literature. Therefore, we as modern readers struggle more today to understand and properly apply this apocalyptic literature, the book of Revelation, to our lives than previous generations of Christians. We get caught up in the imagery and lose sight of the message of hope found in this book. I think this is the main reason the book of Revelation is my least favorite book of the Bible. That being said, though, I recognize that Revelation is still useful not only for us, but for me personally and my walk with Jesus. Before we dive into the text for today, I want to mention the four most common ways that this book has, has been and is still being interpreted. The first, the first method, the first way, is the futuristic method, the futuristic way of inter interpreting it. Everything, the futuristic interpreters claim that everything written in the book of Revelation is about the last days and the end times. They see stories in the news and they, they compare those to the, to the images and the stories that they hear in the book of Revelation. Several weeks ago, my, my sister-in-law, Jenny, sent me this meme. Now, it, it amusingly depicts this way of interpreting Revelation. And the problem with this method of interpretation, even though it is still popular, it, it can lead to an all-consuming fear, and it can lead us into despair. It offers very little hope for the things that are around us. Several years ago, there was a popular book series that was actually made into a movie series called the Left Behind series. How many of you have read those books? I only got about halfway through them, and then I lost interest. These books are based on a futuristic interpretation of the book of Revelation. So the second way of interpreting Revelation is histo uh, historic. And the people that use this method, and actually this method is the oldest method, uh, and that they look at history and they compare it to what they read and see in the book of Revelation. And all these different events in, in history are then compared to or called out in the book of Revelation. Uh, his, historicists say they can find the start and the spread of Islam. And people like world leaders and popes are identified as the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 3, historicists claim, is the Protestant Reformation. But this method of interpreting Re Revelation actually kind of came to an end in the 1800s. Then there's the preterist. This is the most popular approach of mainline scholars today. They recognize that the book of Revelation is actually a letter to seven specific churches in specific contexts that deal with their current situation. Like what I mentioned about hope found in the prophets a few weeks ago, we recognize ourselves in the book of Revelation, so its message of hope is still applicable to us today. We see ourselves in the book of Revelation even though it was written to these seven specific churches. And then there's this fourth method, the idealistic method. And in this method, Revelation is the biblical version of Star Wars. It's the ultimate story of good versus evil, using these, these fantastic and wild and crazy uh, images of, uh, of good and evil. And the, the ultimate end of the, the idealist uh, is a quote from Rob Bell. It's one of the books that Rob Bell wrote, and that book is Love Wins. So these are the four different ways. And personally, I have to admit, my dislike and my discomfort with, the, with this book of the Bible has actually stunted my study and reflection on Revelation. But I must say, I'm drawn toward the preterist and the idealistic approaches to Revelation as opposed to the futuristic and historicist 
uh, ways of interpreting Revelation. So these are four ways that we interpret the book. So now let's dive into the into the context and look at where uh, where these places are because I think for many of us we're not really familiar with the context and the place where these uh, where these stories actually happened and were written. So having quickly discussed the interpretation methods, let's look at history and geography for just a few minutes. We call this book, we call this a book, but actually it's a letter. It really is a letter written to seven specific churches in Asia Minor. You can see from the map, Rome in Italy is in the northwest part of the map. The Mediterranean Sea is in the middle with Africa to the, to the south and Asia to the east. So these seven churches are actually located in what is modern-day Turkey, in the, um, in the west side of Asia, or Asia Minor. The author is identified as John. Uh, and John has this vision, and he writes down what he sees as a letter to these early Christian communities located in these very important cities in Asia Minor. Church tradition is that John is in exile on the island of Patmos, just a few miles off the coast of Asia Minor. There is another hypothesis, that, though, that John was actually an itinerant preacher, and Patmos was just the place where he happened to be when he had this vision. Revelation 1.9 says, I, John, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So however you interpret that particular verse determines the, way, the, the manner or the reason John is on the island. In my opinion, why John is on Patmos, exile or preaching, is actually irrelevant to the message he writes. I just bring it up to illustrate and show that John is separated from his intended audience. It would be like someone going to Galveston Island and sending a letter to churches in Brownsville Corpus Christi, Port Lavaca, San Antonio, Houston, Beaumont, and Austin. On the map, you can see that Patmos is in red, and the seven churches are on the mainland in yellow. John writes to Ephesus first, and Ephesus is actually the capital of that region. So it is a very important city, and that, that uh, infant church that is uh, that is alive and well in Ephesus is actually a very important church. He then writes to Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And if you look at the map, it makes a circle all the way around in that whole region. So if you look at a map of Texas and those cities I named, it goes along the coastline up to Austin, the capital, that important city, back down to Houston, the coastline, and around Galveston. All of these cities are centers of commerce and significant population centers, just like the towns that I mentioned from Texas. John's message to these churches is a word of encouragement, usually followed by some sort of criticism. Now that we know where these churches are, let's look at what's going on in the wider culture and in the government at the time. Again, there's much debate over when the book of Revelation was actually written. Some say around 69 AD. Some scholars point to around 96 AD. If it's 69 AD, that is right after the emperor Nero completes suicide. If it's 96 AD, it's right before the emperor Dementia was assassinated by people in his inner circle. Now, both of these emperors were part of, a, of a, a cult that began and continued for several hundred years called emperor worship. Uh, and so these, these emperors wanted these Christians to, to worship them, to offer sacrifices in the Roman pagan temples. Uh, but the Christians wouldn't comply, so they became targets of persecution. They were treated as if they were traitors to Rome and were executed. In 64 AD, five years before Nero's death, Nero was under a lot of political pressure. 
Now, this is not a political statement about our current president, President Trump, but if you watch any news source, you will realize that President Trump is being criticized all over the place. Now take that and multiply it by several orders of magnitude, and that's the pressure that Nero was under in Rome as he controlled all of, or almost all of Europe, Asia Minor, and parts of North Africa. His territory was huge. And so Nero, in trying to deflect all of that political pressure, came up with this grand idea, and he hired some, some thugs to start a fire in Rome. And his thought was, well, I'll burn part of the city up, and then I'll raise taxes and rebuild the city the way I want it, and I'll blame the fire on, you guessed it, on this sect of Judaism called Christians. That's exactly what Nero did. Now, uh, this is what the encyclopedia says about an, uh, uh, a Roman historian named Tacitus. Tacitus in, 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 Tacitus in full is uh, Publius Cornelius Tacitus, or Gaius Cornelius Tacitus, and he was born in AD 56, and he died around 120. He was a Roman orator or a speaker, and he was a public official, and probably the greatest historian and one of the greatest prose stylists who wrote in the Latin language. Years later, this is what Tacitus wrote about Nero's persecution of the Christians in 64 AD. In their very deaths, they were made the subjects of sport, for they were covered with the hides of wild beasts and worried to death by dogs or nailed to crosses or set fire to. And when the day waned, they were burned to serve for the evening lights. Nero would execute these Christians as a way to entertain himself and his guests. Now, this is the context in the background of the churches in which John is writing. <clears throat> so talk about some extreme disorientation. This makes our challenges seem petty and minor in comparison to them. So let's find some words of hope that John wrote in the book of Revelation. The first text for today, Revelation 14, verse 12. John writes this. He says, this, this Christian lifestyle, this way of living, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Remember that definition of hope? The believing and acting as if tomorrow will be better in some meaningful way than today. These early Christians actually endure this horrific persecution, not for a day, not for months, not even for years, but for two and a half centuries, 250 years, they endured this kind of persecution. It's not until 325 AD when the Roman Emperor Constantine becomes a Christian that this persecution actually ends. So what is it that fuels their hope and enables them to endure? The risen Christ. They experience, they believe, and they know that the risen Christ has conquered death. So no matter what happens, even when they die, Jesus is always much, much greater. The power that Jesus has is much, much greater than the power that the emperor of the Roman Empire has. Plus, as these early Christians suffered unimaginably, the non-Christians around them were actually drawn to Christ, so the church actually grew. Is the way you're suffering drawing people to Christ and filling them with hope? How else does John's revelation bring hope to these early Christians? Now let's turn, turn in your Bible or turn in your Bible app to, to Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. John writes this, 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. A new heaven and a new earth. Talk about a bright and hopeful future. You know what? The same is still true today. Jesus, our risen Savior, is still bringing a new earth into existence through you and me. John's image of a new earth el eliminates pain, grief, and death. What does your new earth look like? John's new earth really hit home for me and my family. So for me, my new earth would include no grief, no illness, no pain, no suffering. You see, about six weeks ago, my father-in-law passed away from cancer. And so our family has be been dealing with the grief and the loss of Paul. Now, we grieve with hope because we know that one day we will see Paul again because our risen Savior Jesus Christ has conquered death. We're still sad, but we're sad with hope. Several, uh, actually it's, it was uh, the beginning of last year and I serve uh, one of the volunteer things that I do in our community is I serve on the Texas Health Resources Community Impact Board. And I'm the president of that board this year. And so I began our meetings with our, our new board this year with this question. If you, were, if you were to eliminate one of these things, which one would it be? Would you eliminate war, hunger, or illness? What is it for you? What would your new earth look like? What would you eliminate? What is one thing, just one thing that you can do to take one step toward making your new earth a reality? John's revelation didn't stop with just a new earth though. He went on to see Eden restored. Remember the Bible begins in the Garden of Eden, this paradise where creation happens. And the, and the people that God creates walk with him and they talk with him. They, they stroll around the garden and the, the people care for the garden and God cares for the people. Well, guess what? The Bible ends in that same garden that has been restored. Because the people rebel against God, sin enters into humanity. And there's a curse, there's a brokenness. Sin and evil enter into the world. And there's a separation of people from God. But through Jesus Christ, that separation has now been conquered. And John ends his vision in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of water of, of the water of life. Remember, Jesus said that I am the, the water, I am uh, a life-giving water. He says to the Samaritan woman, if you asked of me, I would give you living water. I am living water. So the angel, so John writes in Revelation 22, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. 
and the leaves of the tree for the healing are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Like I said, the Bible begins and it ends in a perfect garden. This too brings hope. What can we do as a church to make this new Eden a reality? The thing that struck me about this particular section of text is that the leaves of the tree bring healing to the nations. This final hope isn't just for us as individuals. It's for groups of people. It's for communities, for societies, and nations. That's why one of the things that I love doing is serving on Texas Health Resources Community Impact Board. Because through the work that we do there, we make, a, we make an impact on the health and wellness of people all throughout our community. And how do we do it? We do it one person at a time. John's text also says that, that they, the, the people in heaven, will see his face. Do people see Jesus in you? Do you see Jesus in other people? Several times throughout the week, I'm, I'm asked, and our congregation provides community assistance to people who have fallen on hard times. You know anybody that needs a little bit of extra help? Somebody they got furloughed or laid off or their job just completely disappeared because of this COVID crisis? Well, when the people come and, uh, and get community assistance from our church, many times I say to them, thank you for being Jesus for our congregation. But you know what? It's even deeper than that. What revelation is God showing you? Is God showing you a new earth? Is God giving you glimpses of a new Eden, a garden restored by the grace and the love and the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for your revelation. As hard as it is to interpret and understand, we thank you that in our seasons of disorientation, you are with us. You fill us with hope. You provide us with hope through your son, Jesus Christ, and through each other, through our study of your word, through our prayers, and through our action. God, fill us with the knowledge and the belief that tomorrow will be better in a meaningful way than today so that we may share your hope with all those around us. God, help the world see Jesus in us and help us see Jesus in the world. Please join with me in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If the Holy Spirit is nudging you to make some kind of public response or private response to come and to join our church family in any way that we accept members, please reach out to me. If you're comfortable, leave a comment 
either on YouTube or on Facebook. If you want it to be a little more private, shoot me a text message. My phone number is 817-637-0682. And I promise you, I will get back with you. Because we want, we need to share God's hope together. Please stand wherever you are and join in our invitational song as we praise God with music and hope. in the belief that tomorrow truly will be better than today. Go and share that hope with the world around you. Go make disciples who make a difference by loving God and loving your neighbor. Amen. <laughs>